Hey guys, in this topic we're going to be looking at some of your physics for OCR Gateway, waves and radioactivity. To follow along with this, to make sure you've covered everything and haven't missed any sections out, then you can get the free revision guide which you can download from my website. A transverse wave goes up and down. From one point to another point, and this doesn't matter whether it's from the top to the bottom, from the middle to the middle, we have the wavelength. The amplitude is measured from the middle to the top, or from the middle to the bottom. The direction of movement for this is up and down. This could also be the direction of oscillation. And the direction of energy transfer is sideways. Here we have our longitudinal wave where we have areas of compression. and areas of refraction. We can measure the wavelength in this from one point to another point. The direction of movement is side to side. And so it's the direction of energy. Frequency is the number of waves per second. So if we look at this block here as a second in time, something that have a low frequency, we are not going to see many peaks in one second. But something that had a high frequency, we would see lots of peaks or lots of waves within one second. You'll notice that for the high frequency one, it has a low wavelength. Whereas for the low frequency one, it has a high or a long wavelength. To work out the speed of a wave, wave speed, we can take the frequency and times it by the wavelength. Our units for speed are in metres per second. Frequency is in hertz, capital H, lowercase z, and wavelength is in metres. If we want to measure the time period for something, that is 1 over the frequency. Time is measured in seconds, and frequency is measured in hertz. There is a capital H and a lowercase z. Do not write lowercase both letters or uppercase both letters because they are wrong. Refraction happens when a wave passes from one medium into another medium, say from air into glass or air into water, and it will change direction. So here is our normal here, move it down to here. Um, it will change direction as it goes through there. And the reason it changes direction is because the wave changes speed, but different parts of the wave change speed at different points. So this part down here that hits um, first is going to change speed, either getting faster or slower before this part of the wave up here, which hasn't changed uh, medium or speed yet. When a wave is reflected, it is going to come in meet the boundary and then be reflected off. Our angle of incidence is always going to be equal to our angle of reflection. So we can always say that I equals R. Your normal line is in the middle here. It is a dashed line and it is drawn at 90 degrees to the mirror or the surface that the wave is being reflected off. If we have a sound wave instead of a light wave that is being reflected, we are going to get an echo. A sound wave is a longitudinal wave.
it vibrates the air particles. And your eardrum in here will pick up the vibration of the air particles and turn it into sounds which your brain can interpret. The range of human hearing is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. We can use echo or ultrasound to determine distance and we can do that because speed equals distance over time. So if we know the speed of the wave, we can measure the time taken and we can calculate the distance. So um, a vessel exploring the sea can send down um, an ultrasound and measure the time it takes to come back. And the time it takes to come back will be shorter or longer depending on the distance. Now the really, really important thing to um, note here is that it is there and back again. So the time is double um, what it would be. Because the time it takes to get there and back is twice just the time it takes to get there. So if you have an echo or an ultrasound um, calculation you need to find distance, you need to think logically about the time calculation that you're using. Ultrasounds can also be used for medical imaging. Here is my massive bump, here was my massive baby. And you can see the hard parts, the jaw, the skull, the legs, they are going to reflect the ultrasound much more than the liquid or the soft tissue parts. If we want to measure the speed of a wave, we can use a ripple tank. Um, this here will go in and out of the water, creating waves. From this, we can measure wavelength and also looking at how many waves pass a certain point in a second frequency then we can use our equation um, to work out the speed of the wave. V equals F times lambda. Here we have the electromagnetic spectrum uh, from radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-ray and gamma rays. Um, over here these ones are high energy and these are low energy. These are going to have a high frequency and these ones a low frequency. These are going to have a short wavelength and these are long wavelengths. Wavelength for radio waves can stretch into the, the meters, the kilometers, very, very long wavelengths. Our radio waves can be used for radio communications. Microwaves can be used for mobile phones and for heating food. Infrared are used for things like um, the button, the, the light on your remote control. You can also use it for heat sensing. Visible light is used for cameras in your eye. Ultraviolet can be used for detecting things like um, fake money. Um, X-rays are used for broken bones and gamma rays can be used for treating cancers or sterilising things like killing bacteria. Using a prism or water in this circumstance, visible light can be broken up into its different parts. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Red light is going to have a wavelength of 7 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, moving through to violet, which is going to have a wavelength of 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Frequency, we're looking at the other way around, so the frequency of red light is going to be 4 times 10 to the 14 hertz, whereas indigo is going to be 7 times 10 to the 14 hertz. A converging lens 
is shaped like this and this is the shorthand for it. It is used to correct long sightedness, it's going to produce a real image and it's a type of lens used in magnifying glasses. I have made many, many videos showing you how to do ray diagrams, but just as a quick recap, for a converging lens, your first line needs to go from the top um, to the lens and then on the other side through the primary focus. Your third, second line needs to go from the top through the middle. I should extend that line a touch. Your third line goes from the top through the focus until it gets to the axis then it runs parallel with the axis and is going to be there then over here we are going to get our image formed and that image is going to be upside down so the top is there and the top is there your diverging lens is going to be curved in like this, and this is the shorthand. It's going to correct short sightedness, it's going to give us a virtual image which is upright but smaller. Drawing a diverging lens, our first line goes from the top of the object to the axis, and then we need to backtrack through the um, focus on the same side. So I'm just going to draw a dashed line here, and then the line will actually go like that. And our second line needs to go from the top of the object through the middle. And where those two points cross, there is going to be our virtual image. An atom is incredibly tiny. The word atom means uncuttable, and it's so tiny that the Greeks who named it an atom thought it was the smallest thing. But it isn't the smallest thing. We know there are things inside of it. Now, I said it was incredibly tiny, its size is 0.1 to 0.5 nanometers, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 10 to 5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Now, inside our atom, we have protons and neutrons, and in the shells on the outside, we have electrons. This bit in the middle here, this is called a nucleus. Protons and neutrons are located in the nucleus, whereas electrons are in the outer shells. Protons have a mass of 1, neutrons have a mass of 1, and electrons are incredibly tiny. Their mass is 1 2 thousandths that of mass of a proton or a neutron. Protons have a charge of plus one, neutrons have no overall charge, and electrons have a charge of minus one. Here we have two isotopes of carbon. You can see they have the same atomic number, six, but different mass numbers, which means each of them is going to have six protons. They are each going to have six electrons, but when it comes to the mass number, one of them has 12 minus six, six neutrons and one of them has 14 minus six eight neutrons an isotope is an atom that has a different number of neutrons there are three types of radiation alpha radiation beta radiation and gamma radiation alpha radiation is also known as the helium nuclei Beta radiation is also known as an electron, and gamma radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, it's a wave. A helium nuclear and alpha radiation can be rewritten as alpha 4 2, mass of 2, positive charge of um, mass of 4, positive charge of 2. An electron can be written as E, mass of um, 0, charge of minus 1, and gamma is again just a wave. Alpha radiation is very large, whereas gamma radiation is very small. Alpha radiation is highly ionising, whereas gamma radiation is not. Ionising means how good it is at knocking electrons off, so how good it is at turning something into an ion. Gamma radiation is highly penetrating, whereas alpha is not. 
To stop alpha radiation, a bit of paper or a bit of skin will do it. Aluminium foil or thin foil will stop beta radiation, but thick lead is needed to stop gamma radiation. A Geiger Miller tube will measure radiation. It generally clicks every time it hears a bit of radiation. And the unit for radiation is the Becquerel. Half-life is the time it takes for half the radioactive atoms to decay into something else. We can use that as a graph if we take 100% and 50%, read across with a ruler and down, 50% across with a ruler and down, and that there. The time between having 100% activity and 50% activity, or whatever value and half of whatever that value is, is going to be the half-life. The half-life of something can range between very quick milliseconds to thousands, hundreds of years. The calculations for this are a lot simpler than they look. Here we have uranium-238, it is going to, going to go alpha to K, alpha is 4 T. So we have 238 minus 4 gives us 234, 92 minus 2 gives us 90. Then we need to use periodic table to look up what has an atomic number of 90, giving us thorium. For beta decay we have minus beta. 0 minus 1. 238 minus 0 gives us 238. 92 minus minus 1 gives us 93, which gives us Neptunium. It does not matter about the mass number for these calculations, the atomic number is the important thing. Different isotopes of an element are going to have different half lives. You need to know all of the different sources of background radiation. Now, the majority of background radiation comes from radon gas. This is about 50%. And this picture here um, shows a beautiful scene from down in Cornwall, down in Devon, because that area has a lot of radon gas going on. Then we have medical, and about 14% comes from medical x-rays, from different medical treatments such as x-rays or CT scans. Then we have stuff that comes up from the ground. This again is about 14%. Then we get slightly smaller and these are the sort of things that you really can't avoid because you do get some background radiation from food and drink and this is about 11.5%. Moving on to slightly smaller amounts now, cosmic radiation, radiation that we get from space, is going to be about 10%. Even smaller amounts now, from testing of nuclear weapons, it is going to be about 0.2%. From plane travel, and this obviously varies between person, because the more you travel on a plane, the more radiation you are going to be exposed to. And then the last one, we're all going to get a teeny tiny little dose from nuclear power stations. And those are your sources of background radiation. The uses of radioactive activity are quite varied. And what total radioactivity you're going to use is going to depend on the half-life. And it is going to depend on the type of radiation. Gamma radiation can be used for cancer treatment and for sterilising materials because it is very good at killing cells. If it is going to be in a bit of medical equipment, we're going to need it to have a very long half-life. Beta radiation can't get very far, so it's just for things that need a short distance. For example, testing the thickness of foil that's being made or carpet, uh, cardboard that's being made. Uh, if too much beta radiation gets through, then we know it's too thin. If not enough gets through, then we know it's too thick. For this, we need a long half-life because it's within an industry. Whereas for a medical tracer, we don't want it to have a long half-life. We want it to get out of the body as quickly as possible. Alpha radiation is used in smoke alarms and this again we want it to have a long half-life. 
in nuclear fission, the breaking apart of atoms, we have a chain reaction. The first neutron is fired out of something um, and it hits our heavy, heavy um, radioactive element, whether that's uranium or plutonium, um, it doesn't really matter for this instance. It splits it and we are going to get... The example would like you to draw three neutrons coming out, some neutrons coming out, some um, radiation coming out, and some smaller atoms. The neutrons that come out can then go on and hit other nuclei. So it keeps going, and every single um, reaction releases a neutron which can go on and hit something else, which is why it's called a chain reaction. These nuclei, once they hit, they break down into smaller nuclei, release neutrons, um, and radiation. Nuclear fusion is a process that takes place in our stars. It is going to be where nuclei fuse together to make one nuclei, one large nuclei. It's going to be combined with the release of energy, whether this is going to be light, heat or sound or all three in the case of our star.